So thank you for joining us, Dr. Anita. Um, it's a pleasure having you on board. So this is the next session where we are discussing the roadmap to sustainable aviation. Um, with me, I have Dr. Anita. She, uh, she's Dr. Anita Sangupta. She's an aerospace engineer, educator, instrument rated pilot. Uh, I would never have guessed that she's a, you know, I would actually meet a rocket scientist in life. As she, she is a rocket scientist and a veteran of the space program. Uh, she's developed technologies that have enabled the exploration of Mars uh, and deep space for 20 years. She is currently the research professor of astronautics um, at the University of Southern California, focused on green transport and in space propulsion technology development. She is also an aviation entrepreneur. Um, she's a founder of Hydroplane and a co-founder of AXX, ASX, which, and also she's on the board of NCTAR. Uh, together with uh, Dr. Anita, I have Professor Roberto Sabatini. He's a professor of the Aerospace Engineering and Aviation at RMIT, RMIT University, Australia, and he specializes in avionics, air traffic management, and serves as a chair of the Cyber Physical and Autonomous Systems Group. Uh, he's also deputy director of the Sir Lawrence Weckert Center and director of the Autonomous and Intelligence Systems Lab Laboratory of RMIT University. So um, thank you again for joining us. And today um, I would just like to start off with a summary of what this is about. So commercial aviation accounts for about 2% uh, of the global carbon emissions, while about 12% of all CO2 emissions come from the transportation sector. So within these figures, a business and general aviation are accounted for. Uh, but it's always been a challenge to calibrate just how much these subsectors contribute globally versus the scheduled commercial sector. So, um, Dr. Anita, it's 2050, 2050 and uh, zero carbon targets have been met globally. What does the aviation industry look like now and how is it different from today? today? So I think um, it's actually good to think about some of the changes that we're experiencing in the very current day because of obviously the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which means that there's going to be a shift in the aviation market, uh, which is relevant to the use cases. So I see that today commercial aviation is largely the regional market, which is one hour flights from point A to point B. Um, I actually see by 2050 that we'll see a much larger contingent of ground-based transport technologies, which are green, such as the Hyperloop and high-speed rail, which means that the aviation market might shift away from regional and then become something more similar to um, or actually just basically doing transatlantic transpacific much longer distance travel and also adding in the use case of urban air mobility which would enable people to travel at much faster speeds from rural to suburban locations and rural to urban locations and within suburban and urban locations. I also see a shift to emission-free aviation, so basically jet aircraft that are fueled by hydrogen, mm -hmm. green hydrogen as the energy carrier, and I think that hydrogen fuel cells are going to be the enabling technology to make that happen in the 2050 timeframe. Nice. And Professor Roberto, what are your thoughts? Uh Look, uh, uh, the, looking at the present situation, uh, uh, we have uh, virtually uh, just 20% perhaps of the aviation we used to have uh, due to COVID-19. So um, in terms of uh, sustainability issues, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, targets, very ambitious targets, very ambitious goals that have been set by ACARE uh, in Europe. Uh, also NASA with its follow-on follow program. Uh, so the agenda is quite ambitious in terms of carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxides uh, reduction, as well as uh, noise. Noise is a very important aspect of sustainability. So it's not just about carbon uh, or uh, greenhouse uh, effects or gases that can have a greenhouse effect like nitrogen oxide, but also is about noise. Uh, the the expectation is that uh, as soon as uh, uh, the current uh, restrictions due to COVID-19 are removed, uh, um, aviation will go back uh, uh, to similar uh, kind of growth rates experienced over the past uh, 15 years or so. 
which are uh, you know amazingly high. So the aviation industry and the aerospace industry as well, I, I call them aviation and aerospace collectively, have to uh, develop measures that can mitigate the environmental impact. Uh, so these measures uh, include uh, a variety of uh, uh, areas. Uh, so for propulsion, so um, fuel efficient power plants, but also electric, more electric uh, uh, systems, including hybrid uh, propulsion solution that uh, are showing promises, not just for unmanned aircraft systems, but also for, la for large uh, commercial passenger aircraft. New uh, aerodynamic shapes, so the blended wing uh, is one of the most promising technologies, blended wing, uh, box wing as well, uh, are showing promises. Obviously, the introduction of such technology require changes in the infrastructure. Uh, one intuitive area is the uh, passenger evacuation from blended wings, uh, or you know the kind of fueling systems uh, um, and refueling system at airports. Um, the, the connection also the uh, between uh, uh, the uh, um, you know the, the, the air side and land side and all the implication uh, and this calls for another area of improvement which is at the airport level so the airports will also have to um, uh, introduce measures that uh, uh, perhaps are a bit more strategic in nature but uh, towards greening. Uh, so effectively mitigating environmental impacts by uh, introducing uh, additional forms uh, of transport, so multimodal transformation uh, of airports is, is a big area of current research. And uh, still on, uh, uh, this is a bit of both, not just aircraft, but also infrastructure. Uh, one of the single most promising technologies is biofuel and alternative fuels in aviation, including hydrogen fuels. Uh, so I think this is one of the areas where uh, the greatest promises uh, and, and, and the greatest uh, impacts can be delivered in the future, potentially reversing um, the, um, you know, the, the so making aviation carbon neutral. Um, uh, it would not be possible, the, the aviation community agrees that it would not be possible just by changing based on the technology we know today, just power plants or dynamic shapes uh, and so on. And another very important area is uh, uh, introduction of advanced uh, operational concepts, not just procedures, but also advanced uh, avionics and air traffic management systems that will uh, streamline the flow of traffic, uh, maximizing uh, the efficient use of the airspace while obviously maintaining uh, and, and keeping safety, uh, so achieving the safety targets in all classes of airspace. So these are the, the main areas from uh, um, you know, uh, an emissions perspective. And when discussing about avionics and ATM, also the noise issue uh, can be addressed because uh, uh, aircraft trajectories can be optimized to avoid the, uh, effectively uh, impacting the people or people on the ground. Um, and this is very important, in particular in proximity of uh, large metropolitan areas, uh, which is where most uh, uh, airports currently reside. And so it's a, it's a holistic approach that needs to be implemented. Uh, so the noise reduction at source from the power plant, uh, the use of blended wing would also facilitate uh, uh, and, and reduce the perceived noise as uh, engines uh, the power plant would be installed on top. Typically, the configuration uh, is such that uh, uh, you know the noise is at source is natively uh, mitigated, but inevitably there will also have to be uh, some uh, trajectory optimization and uh, system, avionics and ATM system that facilitate uh, multi-objective trajectory optimization problems in real time. And this is one of the challenges need to be addressed in all classes of airspace. Um, one uh, uh, great opportunity is uh, low-level ATM, so uh, UAS, Amanda Ecosystem Traffic Management and Urban Air Mobility, uh, but uh, this also brings sustainability challenges in terms of uh, emissions and noise in particular, one of the greatest concerns, especially from uh, uh, public perception 
um, as public uh, opinion uh, perspective. So we need to then uh, uh, again uh, implement uh, an approach that uh, uh, responsibly look at the various phases of the life cycle of the systems and uh, uh, implement appropriate models to mitigate the environmental impacts uh, again at the platform level, uh, at airport level, and also from an air traffic management perspective. So. Um, <laughs> Can hear myself. Yes. My next question would be: um, Sustainable aviation fuels will be crucial for the industry's energy transition. So, in in your opinion, Dr. Anita, how close is the industry at realizing these fuels' full potential? Um, what are the opportunities, the barriers, the challenges getting there? So I think the main barrier is cost and cost competitiveness. And in order to switch to more sustainable biofuels, for example, we really need government mandates and incentives um, from the consumer level to the operator, to the aircraft manufacturer to make that be um, the new baseline. So we'll also need new infrastructure to support that. So eventually if we do shift over to hydrogen, we'll need new green hydrogen infrastructure, whether that's offshore wind or solar farms. Um, but that's gonna have to be a priority from the government side, coupled to the commercial side to ultimately reduce the aviation, um, the footprint of the carbon footprint of aviation. Right. So um, because people are flying now, well, not now, but prior to the pandemic, they were taking just short, short uh, flights and all that. So it, it did make a lot of, uh, uh, it left a lot of carbon footprint, right? Yeah, and I guess one thing to add to that is I am actually based in Los Angeles, and because of the reduction in travel, because of obviously safer at home orders where we're having less people on the roads, almost no air traffic, our air quality has become so wonderful and so clean that I saw something on the news a few weeks ago that now um, LA is one of the cleanest cities of the large cities around the world. So we can really see how by reducing our carbon emissions, we can improve the quality of life for everybody. Yes, that's true. I mean, in, even in Malaysia, we can see the difference. Uh, we can actually see the skyline, um, more blue skies, cleaner rivers. So in a way, it is helpful in terms of healing our planet. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, this will be continuous. You know, we'll look more into green solutions and, and uh, more sustainable solutions. So, um, and Dr. Um, Professor Roberto, what are your thoughts? Uh, look, at, when looking at alternative fuels, uh, that include predominantly two technologies that are the most promising at the moment. So, uh, biofuels, second generation biofuels, and particularly from algae, uh, they are very promising in terms of the energy that they can deliver. Uh, the issue, uh, obviously, is the cost at the moment uh, of uh, uh, you know harvesting and producing. Uh, large quantities of uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of biofuels from algae, but realistically is, uh, uh, is one of these technologies that show most promising. Other technologies have been proposed, uh, no, so still in the second generation uh, crops like Camelina and Jatropha, which, has a, which have a relatively high uh, oil yield, uh, have been proposed, but uh, the kind of uh, uh, extensive uh, um, to the, the, the large territories that are required to uh, effectively uh, harvest the crops uh, have been one of the uh, of the factors that have limited growth. So I would expect that algae, from uh, looking at the second generation biofuel, is uh, uh, probably one of the most promising technologies. Provided you know uh, uh, the um, the investments uh, are made. Uh, another great, very promising area is the use uh, of hydrogen fuels. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, yes. that includes both. Yeah, so that includes both uh, uh, hydrogen in its liquid form and uh, 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 hydrogen uh, uh, fuel cells. So fuel cells produce electricity, so we, we, we uh, get back to the, to the need uh, of hybridizing uh, power plants, especially for large uh, commercial aircraft, and at the moment, uh, uh, you know the uh, the ability of uh, uh, batteries to store uh, energy is the uh, one of the limiting key limiting factors. Um, from a liquid hydrogen perspective, there are many opportunities. 
Uh, in particular, if you look at ways of uh, modifying the life cycle, so the way the hydrogen is produced and stored, that uh, inevitably call for cryogenic kind of uh, uh, infrastructure. And that is, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, challenges that might be, must be solved. Again, there, are, uh, there is a need for substantial research and development investments, but also um, extensive modification of the current uh, airport infrastructure for storing, uh, well, distributing, storing, and actually performing um, refueling of aircraft. So several challenges to be addressed. And um, um, companies like Airbus, they are very active in the development of electric and hybrid technology. How will this technology impact the sustainable aviation? Yeah, as I said, it's one of the most promising areas. So uh, going more electric or even uh, in, in, in a long term future, fuel electric, uh, full electric is one of the main areas uh, of current uh, development and investment. Uh, I think we're going to see this uh, happening uh, first uh, on uh, general aviation and perhaps uh, uh, both men and unmanned uh, uh, urban air mobility vehicles. Uh, it's where I see this technology maturing sooner. Uh, there are advantages indeed. Uh, reduced noise emissions is one of them. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, reduced gases emissions. Um, from uh, you know, a large commercial passenger aircraft uptake, at the moment there are issues with current generation, present generation uh, aerodynamic shape. So if you look at the shape of an aircraft, this, the standard uh, uh, shape of an aircraft, even if uh, uh, with respect to the 50s, right, there's been a, a lot of development, but the current generation like the Dreamliner or the Airbus 380, right, do not differ much uh, from uh, uh, in terms of shape from uh, uh, from the earlier generation uh, aircraft like like the comet for example if you look at them you know it's not a huge difference so the introduction of, of uh, uh, hybrid uh, uh, propulsion uh, has to be done also in association with evolution in the aerodynamic shape so the blended wing uh, uh, is one of the ideal shapes and also this, uh, the also the box wing because effectively you can implement what is called distributed propulsion, so have uh, forms of hybrid distributed propulsion on blended wing or box wing uh, uh, kind of aircraft, which will uh, uh, in turn uh, maximize uh, efficiency and also um, uh, reduce uh, the noise signature uh, of the aircraft. So both, uh, you know, like uh, um, reducing gases emission and noise emission is possible with the adoption uh, of hybrid technology, but again, it, it has to be done uh, the right way. So no, you can't simply attach an hybrid engine or you can have a plug and play replacement uh, of, uh, you know, a present generation turbofan engine on uh, uh, on an aircraft like a Dreamliner or, or, or a 380. It's not possible. So something else must be done. And, and, and obviously substantial investments are required to develop uh, research and develop this kind of technologies. How far do you think we are this happening? Uh, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but, uh, uh, you know, we can make uh, uh, some educated guesses based on the maturity level uh, of this technology. So I would say from a research perspective, uh, this technology are no longer in a research lab. They've been uh, also extensively fly tested. Um, so now is a matter of uh, going from a relatively high TRL, six or seven, up to nine, so making products effectively, uh, which would require substantial investments, both on uh, the technological development, you mentioned Boeing, Airbus, or the uh, aerospace industry, but also uh, uh, we need to look at, uh, more holistically, at the aviation industry, the kind of uh, uh, air traffic management systems that need to evolve, kind of airport systems that need to evolve to facilitate uh, effectively uh, holistic uh, development and introductions and introduction of these technologies. So it's really about, uh, uh, you know, how the regulations will evolve to address the challenge. ICAO is working uh, hard uh, with the ESCAPE, Committee on Aviation Environmental Protection, 
uh, on uh, you know developing effectively sustainable aviation agenda and regulations for noise and uh, emissions. Um, I think uh, uh, again, uh, it's uh, it's a balance of technology, but also policy and regulation evolutions that need to be uh, uh, introduced. Um, again, uh, uh, with the uh, with the with the perspective of uh, uh, introducing the most sustainable, the most uh, uh, economically viable, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know socially and 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 financially sustainable solution uh, for the long term. So looking at the three areas of intervention, not just the aircraft in isolation or a particular technology that we might pick up. There are several. Um, again, holistically looking at what can be done at an aircraft level and at, at an aircraft uh, design level, uh, that includes avionics, uh, but also uh, aerodynamics and propulsion. What can be done at an airport level, effectively to allow this new uh, kind of aircraft to be to introduce to enter service with all the uh, you know uh, um, the, the support required for more fuel efficient power plant alternative. Uh, fuels like biofuel and hydrogen fuels, and uh, uh, indeed uh, also the uh, uh, the air traffic management systems. I'm talking here about the airspace evolutions that need to occur. Uh, just to give you an example, current standards, safety standards for separation between aircraft are based on their mass and size, and are relatively straightforward um, and containing to stand. And now, one, once you introduce new uh, this brilliant and uh, concepts, uh, a large amount of new research will have to be done on, uh, uh, you know, the way the airspace is managed. And, you know, when the aircraft are, are in route, uh, you, you can make uh, uh, conservative assumptions as, as far as the uh, traffic density are uh, limited. But this certainly cannot be done at low level. And that's why one of the greatest challenges of present day, both technologically and from a sustainability perspective, is low-level air traffic management, um, you know, with a variety of challenges that includes aircraft design, but also uh, increasingly the adoption of communication, navigation, surveillance, uh, and, and air traffic management technologies that can support uh, uh, safe and uh, sustainable operations. By the way, my cat is also joining me. So. Oh, my cat might make an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> I know they're like they they just love the spotlight, right? <laughs> she usually makes at least one appearance per 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 phone call. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll go to my next question. So, uh, Dr. Anita, I think this will be super duper exciting and uh, something that you really love to talk about. You've been working on new developing new age eco-friendly solutions for transportation in smart cities. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Sure. So in terms of my background, I spent most of my career working on the space program, specifically at NASA and the robotic space program. And when you design a spacecraft um, and spacecraft systems to leave uh, the gravitational well of Earth to travel to a new destination, to a new planet, um, the ultimate goal of the engineer is resource optimization, which means reducing power, reducing mass, being as efficient as you can. So now I'm trying to use those same techniques of designing things for the space program and focusing them on green transportation technologies in my capacity as a research professor at USC. And so if we can use that same sort of mindset to develop these green transportation technologies, we can shift that sector. And so the areas that I've been focused on, one is the Hyperloop. We can talk about it more if you want to, which is a new form of ground-based travel, which can be in excess of airline speeds and is green, can actually be energy positive. Another one, of course, is electric aviation for vertical takeoff and landing applications which is one of the companies I co-founded. And then my most recent activity is in the development of hydrogen fuel cells for lighter aircraft to kickstart that hydrogen powered um, aviation sector. Okay, let's go into the Hyperloop. Do let us know what it's about. Sure. So Hyperloop is a brand new form of transportation. The best way I can describe it is a maglev train traveling in a vacuum tube. So by maglev, I mean magnetically levitating, electrically propelled, and inside of a vacuum tube, because you go up in speed, your primary energy consumption mechanism is actually aerodynamic drag. Right. So if you can eliminate the aerodynamic drag around the vehicle, you can actually go to much faster speeds at lower energy consumption. The passengers themselves are inside of a pressurized capsule, which is like an airplane without wings. So they're, of course, safe in a nice pressure environment, but ultimately allow you to go to up to two times the speed of an airline um, at a really low energy cost. 
and this would be it, this would work best uh, within a certain region or is it applicable to long distances you in order to get the benefit of it you do have to travel over long distances so basically in excess of 50 kilometers otherwise it wouldn't be worth your while to accelerate and decelerate uh, but ultimately it can be used over land masses the flatter the land mass obviously the easier it is to implement um, and uh, it, it is uh, a technology which is being developed in a variety of different startups. I worked at one for about two years. Uh, and so we've made a lot of progress on that front. There's even an operational hyperloop for technology demonstration purposes in the desert outside of Las Vegas. Ah, yes. Uh, we don't have deserts. And, and we are pretty, actually, uh, in Malaysia, um, our land is actually quite mountainous. Uh, we've got lots of valleys as well. So I guess uh, the new infrastructure will need to be thought about uh, more deeply. Um, like in Africa, for example, they have more flat lands, right? So different countries will have their different challenges. Um, when do you see this happening in in a lot um, in the U.S.? So I see um, Hyperloop um, technologies being implemented in the U.S., Europe, and the Middle East within the next 10 to 15 years, most likely. I see electric aviation happening much sooner within the next five years. And then I see um, hydrogen fuel cells aircraft um, at a larger scale, let's say jet application, would be probably in the next you know, 15 years or so, is my take on the situation. Okay. Um, so do tell us, how does the hydro hydrogen fuel help in sustain sustainable aviation compared to what we are having it now? So ultimately, we want to reduce CO2 emissions to, to address climate change. So if you were able to get your hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe, from green sources, then you would basically have a carbon emission-free aircraft. And that's the beauty of switching over to hydrogen. Now, there are different types of hydrogen. There's gray hydrogen, um, there's blue hydrogen, and there's green hydrogen. And you want green hydrogen because it means it's been produced by electrolysis from a renewable energy source such as offshore wind or solar farms. And then you really can have a solution, which is emission free for an aviation application. So we are, of course, a couple of years away from the technology to get us there to implement on a jet aircraft, but we're pretty close to being able to implement it on a smaller, lighter scale aircraft. All right. Thank you for that. And um, do share with us what you're working on in your startup. Uh, so right now, I'm taking a look at systems architecture for how to implement hydrogen fuel cells in a smaller, lighter weight aircraft and how to get that going within the next probably year or so. Okay, we're excited to, to actually look forward to it, that um, uh, especially in congested cities, I think that would really help in, um, you know, if, uh, reducing the number of traffic jams. Um, I don't know how it's like in the US, you get a lot of uh, bad congestion. Certainly in Los Angeles probably has one of the worst uh, <laughs> traffic situations in the world prior to COVID-19. Of course, now the freeways are much more empty than they ever have been. Um, so ultimately, when you think about a transportation system for a suburban urban environment, there are many different ways to provide that. One would be metro, subway, light rail, as well as urban air mobility. The advantage of urban air mobility is that you can also connect people in the suburban regions and you connect people in the rural regions. So sometimes when people think about transportation options, they're only thinking about this hub and spoke system, but people in further away also have to have access to those same services, which may be in urban centers. So urban air mobility, um, so emission-free aircraft, which travel 50, 100, 200 kilometers makes a lot of sense. And ultimately, you can also shift over to doing regional markets with these types of aircraft. What is, uh, is the infrastructure already being set? Um, are the plans uh, already taking place? So it really depends upon what your use case is. And uh, I can speak for the United States in terms of the airport infrastructure. I'm a pilot, so I fly all the time. And I fly out of general aviation airports, which are typically smaller airports. They sometimes do or don't have towers, and they have shorter runways. So they're not applicable for jets to land there because the runways are shorter. But you can certainly land a vertical takeoff landing aircraft there. And you can land a smaller, lighter weight aircraft, which requires a shorter um, takeoff distance or landing distance. And so those infrastructure assets already exist and they're underutilized and if you take a look at how many are in the vicinity of los angeles for example everyone knows about lax los angeles international airport but there's 10 to 15 other airports in the vicinity that could be used for these either shorter hop flights or even regional flights between northern california and southern california and one of the things that i learned um, as a non-infrastructure person coming from the space program when i went to work on the hyperloop was that the largest cost of implementing a transportation system is the infrastructure component because you have to acquire land, you have to require right of way, you have to implement power grid systems. Uh, so it's really expensive. So if you can make use of an existing infrastructure asset, you can significantly reduce the time and the cost to implementing this as a transportation system for that um, region. 
Yeah, and, and, and the concern would be, of course, privacy, uh, because you will be going across um, people's properties and all that. So that will be another uh, aspect to look into. Um, well, I guess on that one, though, um, you would, for any sort of um, general aviation application or urban air mobility, you would use the existing airspace rule. So you would fly that in terms of whatever the corridors are, whatever the altitude requirements are, any of the noise um, noise abatement requirements. You would follow the same rules that general aviation aircraft um, on visual flight rules and eventually on instrument flight rules already follow. So you wouldn't be doing anything new in that sense. But one can imagine a higher density in traffic, which might require an update to, let's say, air traffic control to facilitate it using autonomy. Right. Okay. Um, if we, if you were to to leave this session with three tips and three action plans to you know to get people moving into the right direction of a sustainable aviation, what would your three tips be? So I would like for governments to invest in establishing green hydrogen energy infrastructure to facilitate shifting over to um, hydrogen fuel cells for buses, for trains, uh, for uh, large cargo vehicles on the ground, as well as for providing hydrogen to um, aviation aircraft in the future. And so there's a huge infrastructure component to that. And the good news is that it's also shifting over to being renewable. But you got to have that government mandate. you got to have that public support to make these things happen. And ultimately, the consumer, the end user, has to also want to be able to reduce their carbon footprint, which I think people want to do. Yeah, I think I think they're more aware about the damage that they're doing, and hopefully they'd be more open-minded to you know go towards this direction. So all right, so that's one big tip, which will equal three. That's fine. Um, <laughs> thank you again, Dr. Peter, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful being here. All right. Thank you so much, right. uh, Professor. Uh, professor. So we will be seeing the next session, which will cover deeper into the urban air uh, mobility sector. So we'll see you in a bit. Um, and thank you again for joining the session. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.